Right now on The Real Story, campaign season in full swing. Up next, election season. As candidates crisscross the state, we're sitting down with the chairs of the major political parties to tee up some talk about the August primary. Plus, from landmark Supreme Court decisions to local lawsuits and state settlements, I'm one on one with Connecticut's Chief Law Officer, Attorney General William Tarr. All right, good Sunday morning, everybody, and welcome to The Real Story. I'm Matt Karen. We are a month away from the August uh, primary day, August 9th. Uh, to be able to vote, you have to register by August 4th online or through the mail or by August 8th if you register in person. And while there may not be any marquee high-profile races, they're all important in the context of which direction we want the state and the country to go. Joining me now are the chairs of both major political parties here in Connecticut, Nancy DiNardo of CT Dems and Ben Pro of CTGOP. Thank you guys both for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks for having us. All right, let's get right into it. So uh, first question for you both. Uh, voter turnout for the primaries we know historically isn't that great, unless it's a presidential primary or gubernatorial primary. So what are you both doing to get your, your bases, your people to turn out? Nancy, we'll start with you. Well, uh, we have been relying on the candidates primarily to reach out to all the candidates, uh, to all the voters, to remind them that although it's not at the top of the ticket, it's very important that we have people coming out for Secretary of State and for the Treasurer's seat. And we will also be uh, starting that up too, to reach out to people to remind them that the election is coming up in a month and that it's important for them to come out and vote. And particularly with the, we do have a few state rep and state senate seats, so yeah. uh, those as well. We'll get into people. some of those. Yes. Um, uh, ben, what are you doing to try and galvanize your base and bring out people? Uh, similar to what Nancy talked about, um, we have a provision within our bylaws, and I'm not sure if the Democrats have the same, where we can't get involved with a primary. So we can't support or not support a particular candidate in a primary. But um, we're talking to our base, reminding them that August 9th is coming up, um, reaching out to unaffiliates that if they want to vote in this primary, they have to change their registration, as you indicated in the lead-in uh, by August 8th. Uh, it's too late to switch from Democrat to Republican. Republican or Republican to Democrat to vote in that primary. Uh, and we're just going to be reaching out. Uh, we have our digital program of uh, some mail, things along those lines. Uh, but as Nancy said, I think it's the same. It's incumbent upon the the candidates to turn out the vote. People aren't coming to vote for Nancy or me. Uh, they're coming to vote for a candidate. So the candidates really have the yeoman's work they need to do. Also for both of you, um, you know, what, what's what's your pitch to voters for why they should either vote Democrat or vote Republican? What are the issues in your platforms that you think are really going to resonate with people? Ben, start with you. Um, well, for the primary, obviously, um, it's having the registered Republicans have a say in who the candidates are going to be. And, and for us, the, the three primary primaries that we have are U.S. Senate, uh, Secretary of State, and we have a congressional primary in the 4th Congressional District. But the issues, what issues? I, I think the issues are, uh, depending if they're fate, state or federal, uh, on the federal side, clearly it's um, the the failure of the Biden administration uh, to deal with the economy, the failure of the Biden administration and Dick Blumenthal to deal with the border and border security, the influx of fentanyl that's coming through the border as a result of uh, China being allowed to act the way it is, um, the Ukraine war, uh, the price structure, the, su the supply chain structure. On the state side, uh, for us right now, and I think Nancy's probably the same thing, we don't have top ticket um, primaries. So uh, the Secretary of State primary is our big statewide state primary. And I think those are election issues, um, ballot integrity issues, how the office has been managed over the last number of years. And then as we get into you know the state senate and the state rep, they're probably more local type things. Key, key issues with uh, with your voters and your well, platform. We actually, in our platform, you know, we talk about health care, a woman's right to choose, um, voting rights, and uh, 
you know, amongst other things. And I think, you know, that's what we push and our candidates push out as well. And I think what's important, particularly, you know, with the Supreme Court ruling on Roe v. Wade, that it is really important that people remember that it's the Democrats, particularly the Democrats in Connecticut, that have made a difference, but in the country too. We know Mitch McConnell has said that, you know, if he takes over, the first thing he's going to do is put a national ban on abortion. So I think, you know, we have to be very aware of that, is that the Republican uh, candidates for the U.S. Senate will be supporting Mitch McConnell. So it's very important that Connecticut voters remember that. And so, that it needs to be, you know, complete, yeah. not only on this federal side, but on the state uh, side as well. We'll get into some uh, federal discussion. So let me, let's dive into some of these races now, because you both alluded to them. Um, U.S. Senate, which is fascinating to me. Uh, Nancy, this one's for you. Richard Blumenthal serves on a bunch of important congressional committees. He's arguably one of the most visible United States senators. Um, you know, he certainly has a lot of political clout, but he's also 76 years old. He almost always votes with party leaders. So why should Dick Blumenthal get reelected? Well, I think if you look at his record, he has taken, even when he was attorney general, um, he has been out there representing the people. And the fact that he votes with the leadership um, just goes along with the fact that he is representing the people. That, And that's really important. That, um, is he representing the people or is he representing party leadership? You no, know, he, he represents the people. I mean, yes, he votes. If you look at what the party leadership has been doing, in D.C., it has been, you know, standing for the people. Again, the voting rights and Roe v. Wade, amongst the other, the health care. Um, those are all democratic issues that are important to, you know, everybody in the country as well. So ben, going off of that, uh, your endorsed Republican challenger is former House Minority Leader Themis Claritus. Um, she's anything but a rubber stamp. In fact, many would say she's too socially liberal to be electable. Uh, she is unapologetically pro-choice. Um, so why should Republicans be galvanizing behind Themis Claritus? Is she the right choice, or should someone be looking at Leora Levy or Peter Lumage? Well, we have three really strong candidates running in the primary. Uh, Themis is the endorsed candidate coming out of the primary. Both Leora and Peter qualified to be in the primary at the convention. And quite frankly, any one of the three would be a better United States senator than, than Dick Blumenthal. Um, I'm pretty sure that none of them would be keynoting the Communist Party uh, event. I'm sure uh, none of them would be speaking at the Beardsley Zoo 100th anniversary commemoration about abortion and guns to children and families as opposed to talking about the the zoo and all it has done. So I think as we look at it, you know, uh, look, Dick's been uh, in Connecticut politics for well over 30 years. Um, and quite frankly, I think he's um, lost a lot off his fastball. And I think it's time for Connecticut to look at new leadership in a new direction. So there's also uh, potentially some new leadership on the way in the governor's office. Uh, won't be on the primary ballot necessarily, but uh, Ned Lamont in a 2018 rematch against Bob Stefanowski. If you care about polls, QU has Lamont up about six points right now. So give me the soapbox pick from each of you on why your candidate should be the one in the governor's office, uh, Nancy? You know, polls are a, a snapshot at that moment. So uh, polls aren't really significant. And I think if you talk to the average person, you find that they think Ned has done a great job. I mean, he did a phenomenal job with COVID. That's the first thing everybody said. They really appreciate the job he did with COVID, with health care, um, with the budget. And he's also, you know, brought down the pension uh, fund deficit. And um, we have a great um, fund balance. And he's protected that when the Republicans wanted to take it and the rainy day fund and spend it. He's made sure that that wasn't something that we were doing frivolously because over the years, and I think it was under REL that we had a problem because there wasn't much of a rainy day fund. So, um, I, you know, Ned looks at this um, like a business and he's been a successful businessman and he's done a great job in handling it. Bob Stefanowski? Um, I think uh, when you look at Bob's uh, record uh, as a business person uh, with GE uh, in particular, uh, as a senior uh, manager at GE, senior executive at GE, 
he has, I think, the vision for where Connecticut needs to go over the next 5, 10, 15, or 20 years. And, and as we look at where we are right now, um, you know, we look at, you know, the Democrats have been in control for pretty much 40, about 40 years. Uh, the Senate was Republican controlled in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2000, oh, 1998, I believe it was, uh, was the last time there was a Republican majority in the legislature. Uh, the Democrats have had the uh, governor's office now for the last uh, three terms. And basically where we are, we're the bottom of every category you want to be at the top at, and you're at the top of every category you want to be at the bottom at. Uh, and that's wholly on Ned Lamont, Dan Malloy, and the Democrats. Uh, and so I you know, tell people all the time that you have a choice this November. You can either change the decision makers, you can change the direction we're going, or you can continue to embody the definition of insanity and think by electing the same people something's going to change, and we know it's not. Okay. Um, maybe we have time to talk about one more race. We're quickly running out of time here. But I think another interesting one is the race for the 5th Congressional District. Uh, incumbent two-term Democrat Johanna Hayes looking to fend off a challenge from former state senator George Logan, uh, who, if elected, would become the first Hispanic African American in Congress. Now, the National Republican Campaign Committee designated Logan as a candidate who is, quote, on the radar, while Democratic <coughs> National Campaign Committee has designated Hayes as a, quote, at risk incumbent. Uh, talk about these candidates. Uh, ben? Uh, yeah. Uh Fifth district is always an interesting district, uh, and it's kind of gone back and forth over the years between Democrats and Republicans. Probably the more most competitive of the five districts in our state. Um, I think George is a phenomenal candidate. He's a very good state senator. Uh, he's out on a regular basis meeting with people. Uh, Congresswoman Hayes uh, is clearly a vote for Nancy Pelosi and AOC. Uh, she has supported every progressive p possible policy that's out there, uh, and has which has led to where we. Are uh, nationally and within Connecticut from an economy point of view and inflation point of view. Um, and so at the end of the day, again, uh, I go back to if you want to change things, there's only one way to do that, and that's to change the people making the decision. Uh, does Congresswoman Hayes deserve a third Well, term? before we yeah. talk about the Congresswoman, I do have to question, has George moved into the district yet? I mean, legally, he doesn't have to, but he's out there saying he lived with his, he's living in the district with his uncle. I mean, that doesn't even make sense. And, you know, he's making this stuff up as he goes along. Why not just say, I'll move in when I have to, if I win? And quite honestly, I question if he was still, if he won his state Senate seat, if he would even be trying to run for Congress in a district that he doesn't even live in. And Johanna, Johanna has done a great job. I mean, she is in the district, she talks to people, and uh, she relates to people. Uh, she is not a rubber stamp for either AOC or Pelosi. That's very clear. Yep. And uh, they, you know, talk to her, but she's a very bright woman, and she knows what's important for her district. I wish we had more time. I'm going to have to leave it there. It was a great discussion. Uh, Thank, thanks. You. Thank you both for coming on. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right.